So moving on to our first presentation, I will introduce Landon Turlock. Landon Turlock is a government of Alberta appointed hate sorry, government of Alberta appointed hate crimes community liaison, city of Edmonton community social worker, community-based researcher with coalitions creating Equity Edmonton and public educator focusing on supporting survivors of hate crimes and incidents. Please give a warm welcome to Landon. Does this work? It is, it's a little bit far away. Can people hear me okay? All right, wonderful. So uh, thank you all for the opportunity to be here today. I'm really grateful to be able to discuss some research that I recently completed for my thesis on the experiences of people in Edmonton who had reported hate crimes and incidents to organizations there. But before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the traditional land on which I reside and, visit, and am visiting from is in Treaty 6 territory. And I appreciate being welcomed onto the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples today. As we discuss hate crimes and incidents, I hope that I can work towards the pursuit of what one day may be a more supportive and less hateful place to live for all people, and especially recognizing that the experiences of Indigenous peoples as they pertain to hate crimes and incidents require a great deal more attention, understanding, and prioritization. So today, I will provide a quick overview of the research project that I completed alongside coalitions creating Equity Edmonton for my thesis research before spending some time discussing the findings and recommendations. So first, we'll just look a little bit at the overview of the research project. So as we may know, reporting of hate crimes in Canada increased by 72% from 2019 to 2021, which is the year that data is most recently available. And hate crimes have significant negative impacts on both those directly impacted and members of targeted communities. At the same time, there's limited Canadian literature on the experiences of people who report hate crimes and incidents and the ways that organizations respond to these reports. And so Coalitions Creating Equity Edmonton is a group of organizations focusing on anti-racism, hate crime prevention, and anti-discrimination that I've been working and volunteering with since 2019. And we, as uh, members of that organization, recognize that this gap in knowledge impacts service delivery provided to people impacted by hate crimes and incidents. So to fill this gap, we developed a research project to answer the questions that you see on the screen. What are the experiences of people who report hate crimes and incidences to organizations in Edmonton? How do these individuals who have reported hate crimes and incidents experience the ways that organizations respond to these reports? And what are the policy and practice implications of these experiences for organizations that respond to these reports? So to answer that question, uh, we carried out 20 semi-structured interviews between January and June of last year with 18 participants who had reported a hate crime or incident to an organization in Edmonton over the past five years. And so participants experience, or reported experiences related to transphobia, homophobia, Islamophobia, anti-black racism, anti-indigenous racism, ableism, and sexism, as well as intersections of these motivations, as we know that hate crimes often target the intersections of people's identities. Uh, I shared themes and recommendations with research participants and partners to ensure validity, accuracy, and clarity, and there were three main insights gained from this research. So the first one is that how organizations that respond to reports of hate crimes and incidents do not reliably meet the needs of people victimized by these occurrences, which can significantly impact survivors. So participants reported various hate crimes and incidents, including assault, doxing, online and in-person harassment, death threats, discriminatory insults and slurs, neglect and abuse in healthcare and foster care, police intimidation and profiling, rape, sexual assault, and stalking. Participants in the study had many different hopes when they first decided to report their experience, and this included stopping the harm facing themselves or others, seeking justice and raising awareness about the issue so it could be documented and addressed. When reporting to the police, police professional standards branch, or a professional regulatory body, participants hoped perpetrators would be investigated, held accountable, and recognize the harm caused by their actions. Participants who reported to these and other organizations identified hoping for advocacy, support reporting to the police, 
guidance, financial aid, and assistance with mental, physical, and housing needs. At the same time, the resp responses participants hoped for were often different from the ones that they received. These responses I'm going to summarize next, uh, breaking them into uh, services that met survivors' needs and then those that didn't. But the reality is that these actual responses to the reports were more complicated. Organizations often responded in ways that both did and did not meet the survivors' needs, and sometimes a participant reported to multiple organizations and staff before their needs were met at a minimal level, if at all. So in scenarios where participants were most satisfied with the organization's response, responses included being listened to, believed, taken seriously, and not judged or shamed. The organization addressed the matter promptly and was victim-centered. Organizations encouraged and supported participants while providing regular and ongoing follow-up. And responding organizations provided participants access to safety planning and appropriate services or referrals, including mental and physical health care, housing, identification, and legal assistance. Non-police organizations assisted participants in reporting to the police when requested, but they didn't pressure participants to make further reports. Police responded promptly, took statements, and believed the participant. Uh, they searched for the perpetrator, made decisions, including the participant, provided regular follow-up, and made referrals to internal supports like victim services. In some cases, perpetrators were apprehended and held accountable in ways that incorporated the participant's wishes. When responses like these happened, participants felt satisfied, grateful, hopeful, listened to, relieved, and increased confidence in responses from organizations and the reporting process. In addition, they reportedly felt safe, both for themselves and others in their community, uh, that they weren't alone and that they could keep going. However, as I discussed earlier, many responses also had negative impacts, and such responses included being ignored or disbelieved, being discouraged from reporting and facing discrimination and disrespect in a culturally unsafe environment. Participants shared that responding organizations laughed at and victim blamed them. Organizations told them their experience was not serious enough to justify a response or that what they experienced wasn't a crime. And participants regularly received no or little follow-up or even delayed responses that took months or years. Reporting procedures uh, were sometimes complex, demanding, and inaccessible, and some organizations were unaware of appropriate referrals to make. Participants faced confusing staffing changes, mistakes, disorganization, being sent back and forth between services and decisions that did not align with their wishes. Due to responses from organizations that didn't ensure their safety, some participants faced harassment from those they filed complaints against. Further, organizations made decisions that didn't respect participants' wishes, and due to responses from organizations that didn't prioritize the survivor's safety, uh, some participants faced harassment from those they filed complaints against. Uh, some perpetrators weren't investigated or apprehended, and when participants filed complaints about professional conduct, the ways organizations responded seemed to protect the subject of the complaint as opposed to the survivor. And so these negative responses had a range of emotional impacts on participants, including anger, anxiety, confusion, defeat, depression, disappointment, doubt, and frustration. Negative responses also impacted participants' beliefs, including a loss of faith in authorities in the reporting process and a loss of pride in being an Edmontonian. Others developed beliefs that Canada is unjust, that they are not valued, and that justice is not available to them. They further began to perceive that they continued to be unsafe and that those who perpetrated hate crimes and incidents could do so without facing con the consequences of their actions. Negative responses also resulted in behavioral and psychological impacts that included uh, participants abandoning their, abandoning their reports altogether, physical and psychological impacts from the original crime or incident remaining untreated, and participants sometimes experienced re-traumatization, financial losses, online harassment, and suicidality. So I want to share a quote uh, that one of the participants shared with me, and it's, I like them to know what it feels like when people just feel disappointed. I want them to know that we don't feel heard, we just feel defeated, and like it's a, a huge disappointment. Like who cares about us? I'd now like to look at the second insight about hate crimes and incidents in a context of historical and ongoing discrimination. So most participants defined hate crimes and incidents in ways that are similar to most definitions usually used in Canada, and almost all participants connected historical, intergenerational, and ongoing discrimination practices and beliefs within Canada to the hate that they experienced. 
Uh, one participant shared really powerfully saying that so hate was given to me as a child. And many of the same systems that participants reported hate crimes or incidents to, such as police, healthcare workers, the child welfare system, transit operators, and supportive housing organizations, were also named as perpetrators of hate crimes and incidents. So I now want to talk about the third insight from the study that regards factors influencing the decision to report a hate crime or incident. So interpersonal relationships, existing knowledge and beliefs, and previous experiences influence the choices to report a hate crime. Participants in their supports uh, reported hate crimes and incidents to quite a wide variety of organizations that included community organizations and leaders, healthcare providers, lawyers, the media, ombudsperson and human rights offices, the police, the police's professional standards branch, politicians, psychologists, professional and regulatory bodies, religious leaders, social media, and support groups. And many of the participants felt that this was the only option available to them when they made these reports and were sometimes only aware of the organizations they reported to because it was a widely accessed service or platform, they were already familiar or previously involved with the organization, or they referred by a trusted person. So um, when participants reported a hate crime or incident, uh, this choice was influenced by the seriousness or frequency of the occurrence, a pre-existing connection with the organization, encouragement from a trusted person, and a desire to protect others. So we developed 26 recommendations for organizations, police, and government to improve how they respond to hate crimes and incidents, and I'll summarize them now. So for organizations to help survivors of hate crimes or incidents, first points of contact need to focus on the survivor's safety, respond quickly, and show empathy, offering services that are timely while providing regular follow-up guidance and referrals to survivors. And it's also important to understand that people within their organizations may perpetrate hate crimes or incidents and take steps to prevent this. At the same time, uh, participants discussed how having a dedicated role for police like a hate crimes unit or coordinator could evaluate responses and ensure that survivors of hate crimes and incidents receive consistent, high quality services that are timely and client-centered and involve report, or referrals to support services like victim services. And these services staff should be trained to effectively support survivors of hate crimes and incidents. Uh, for government, there should be the use of evidence-based strategies and legislation to address hate crimes and incidents while building relationships with affected communities, funding organizations that assist survivors, and upholding anti-racist and indigenous education. Um, there's a, a lot more in this uh, information and report, so if you want to read it, uh, I, you can check out the QR code here. Thank you. Thank you, Landon. Next, we have David J. Brennan. David Brennan is Professor and Associate Dean of Research at the Factor in Wintosh Faculty of Social Work at the University of Toronto. He is a recent OHTN HIV and Game Leadership Chair in Gain Bisexual Men's Health. Uh, he is also the founding director of the Cruise Lab, an interdisciplinary, community-based social work research lab centered on issues of health and well-being among gay, bisexual, two-spirit, and other men who have sex with men. Please give a warm welcome to David. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to move quickly because I have a lot, so uh, it's awesome to see you all here today. Um, I want to note that the title of this presentation was cut short in the program, so it actually is the long-term effects of childhood bullying, harassment, and rejection on 2SLGBTQ plus people living with HIV, findings from the OHTN cohort study, or the OCS. Um, I want to thank my colleagues at the OHTN, Sagai Bekele, uh, Kristen O'Brien, and Abigail Kroc, uh, in their assistance with this work. Um, childhood bullying has been linked with adverse health outcomes uh, during childhood, during adulthood, sorry. Um, and available evidence shows us that 2SLGBTQ plus people experience elevated levels of childhood bullying due to gender or sexual orientation. Uh, compared to the general population. So um, there's also some really great literature now that strongly suggests that these experiences of homophobia, transphobia, and biphobia have impacts on health. 
I want to make sure I am on the same page here. Data for the current uh, study are from the OHTN cohort study, the OCS, which is a community-governed longitudinal cohort of people living with HIV and receiving care in 15 clinics across Ontario. I think there are six in Toronto, two in Ottawa, um, and Kingston, Sudbury, Thunder Bay, London, Windsor, and Whitby, and Hamilton. Sorry, don't forget Hamilton. Um, the inclusion criteria to be in the study is be at least 16, be HIV positive, able to provide consent, and to live and receive care in Ontario. They, uh, the data is collected through an annual interview at the clinic. Um, and clinical data are extracted from um, the medical charts and augmented through linkage with Ontario Public Health Laboratories. In 2019, um, a six-item tool from the uh, report of the transgender survey was added to the OCS questionnaire to assess experiences of childhood bullying, harassment, and rejection. And the question is basically, during the first 18 years of your life, did any family member um, stop talking to you or end their relationship? Was any family member violent towards you? Uh, were you kicked out of the house? Any of these because of your sexual orientation or gender? Did your family send you to a professional therapist, counselor, because of your sexual orientation or gender? And were you verbally harassed or bullied, were you verbally bullied or harassed at home or in school, or physically uh, bullied or harassed at home or in, at school? So this is just baseline data, so participants were only asked these questions once. Uh, this is a little bit about the study sample. Um, it's, uh, I think, kind of the key things is that it's a little bit of an older sample. Um, not surprisingly, a fairly large portion of this sample uh, identifies as gay, um, and uh, about 95% of the sample are uh, identify as men. And the racial breakdown is listed there as well, about 68% uh, white, 10% black, and um, some other numbers there as well and about 30% are not born in Canada. Um, so what you can see is about 56% of the sample reported that they experienced at least one form of bullying, harassment, or rejection. So they said yes to one of those items. Um, and you can see here that the numbers go down as, uh, as the scale moves forward. Um, so I'm just going to give you a second to look at that and absorb that instead of trying to read it to you for time's sake. Okay. Um, also, in terms of looking at uh, current gender and current sexual orientation, you will see that um, about 84% of uh, the people who reported uh, bullying, harassment, or rejection also identified as two-spirit transgender or another gender category than man or woman. Um, and also in terms of sexual orientation, uh, queer seemed to be the highest and um, lesbian gay as well. Reminder that there, it's, it's very, the number of lesbians in the sample is relatively small but it was still statistically significant. The three top types of childhood bullying and harassment and rejection um, were consistent across race and ethnicity, uh, with the except with uh, being verbally bullied or harassed at home or school, or being physically bullied or harassed at home or school. And then the third most common for most groups by race or ethnicity was that a family member stopped talking to them or ended a relationship, with the exception of the Latinx um, participants who reported who they were more likely to have their third uh, um, type of bullying or harassment as a family member being violent towards them. Data for indigenous to us LGBTQ plus folks are not included here. Um, for those who don't know, the OCS has a very specific governance policy around data collection. And so the indigenous uh, circle that attends to um, when and how data are shared from the study uh, varies. So this particular variable was not, uh, the data from this was not included based on the um, feedback from the community. There are other places where it is reported. 
to us LGBTQ+, plus, uh, who experience childhood bullying, were more likely to rate their current health as fair or poor than those who did not, um, as you can see from, from, the, from the slide here. Oh, no, you can't, ha ha. Somebody has to tell, I'm, I'm trying to do it on my computer because I have notes here, sorry. Um, so uh, you can see from this that the, the red uh, or the burgundy, I don't know, uh, off to the right is uh, reporting of fair or poor current self-rated health among the participants who experience childhood bullying, harassment, and rejection. Um, two SLGBTQ plus folks who experienced childhood bullying also reported significantly higher levels of alcohol use, smoking cigarettes, and non-medicinal uh, drug use than those who did not experience uh, such. And um, those who experienced childhood bullying in any form were also more likely to be report uh, having been diagnosed with a mental health condition and showing current depressive symptoms. So in summary of this question, more than half of participants experienced some form of bullying. Um, two SLBTQ plus folks who uh, identified as two-spirit, transgender, or other reported the highest levels and um, also reported uh, negative health outcomes. The second question was around whether or not people experienced discrimination using the Williams scale. Um, there's a lot in this slide. Uh, Yes, there's a lot in this slide, um, but basically people had uh, to report whether or not they ever experienced any of these uh, conditions, such as being evicted or denied housing, not hired, told to go back to where you come from. If you said yes to any of these questions, then you had to basically def help to define what the top, what the area was. The sample characteristics are almost exactly the same, but there's slight differences, so I wanted to make sure I included that. Um, about 50% of the sample reported any form of unfairness, and you can see the breakdown as to the type of unfairness from fired from a job, denied a promotion, discouraged from continuing education, or denied particular services or housing. Um, the perceived reasons for discrimination were the highest ones, of course, were race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and HIV status. In terms of age, uh, you'll see that among older adults, uh, they reported experiencing unfairness a little bit less. And in terms of gender, again, uh, unfairness reported by the highest, the highest group it reported was reported by as two-spirit uh, trans and, um, sorry, transgender and other. Um, by race and ethnicity, uh, you can see that multi-race and indigenous, this was allowed by our indigenous communities to be reported, um, that among multiracial or indigenous communities, the highest percent of those reported experiencing unfairness. And in terms of sexual orientation, people who identified as bisexual or queer or other had the highest rates. So in summary of that question, about half of our participants who provided data reported experiencing some form of unfairness, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, and HIV status were the three top reasons reported, and experiences of unfairness varied with highest levels uh, among those who identified as two-spirit, uh, multi-race, indigenous, Arab, or Western, West Asian, bisexual, or queer. So the tool that we use to measure, um, the tool from the transgender study is, um, doesn't include things like social bullying, like if you kind of like very purpose making, giving someone the finger or um, making someone, make it, pulling a prank on someone in public to humiliate them or mimicking someone, that was not included in this. And also cyberbullying is not included in that, uh, in that tool. So that's a limitation for sure. Um, and also the recall by, there may be a recall bias among people who are older in terms of a longer period of time between their current age and childhood as to what those experiences may have been, potentially. Or that's an ageist sentiment. I'm not sure, but <laughs> I'm putting it out there because it's possible. Thank you. 
Um, so in conclusion, experiences of childhood bullying, harassment, rejection, and discrimination can have significant impact on mental and physical health. And again, this is a sample of HIV positive, uh, queer and trans folks, um, queer two -spirit, spirit and trans folks. And more research, of course, is always necessary to kind of fully understand the impact and uh, the connections between these experiences and health outcomes or any outcome. And we'd love to see and think about some more interventions and policies that can help to respond to and limit discriminatory behaviors to help improve the well-being of 2SLGBTQ plus people who are living with HIV. And that is that. Thank you for your time and attention. I never knew. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry if I forgot to flip. Thank you, David. So next we have Wilbur Turner. Wilbur is the president and founder of Advocacy Canada and serves as program coordinator, health promotion, and health initiative for men. Advocacy Canada is a nonprofit organization that champions human rights for queer and the queer and trans community. Wilbur's deep-seated social and political consciousness regarding issues affecting the queer and trans community ignited the creation of Advocacy Canada. Wilbur proudly identifies as gay and queer and has made his home in Kelowna, BC, nestled within the unceded traditional lands of the Shi'ok people. Please welcome Wilbur. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm a little raspy from getting emotional um, during the um, keynotes. Um, anyone with me there? Um, it's my pleasure to be here today. Um, as Ricky mentioned, I make my home um, in Kelowna, um, the traditional unceded uh, lands of the Seal people and the Okanagan Nation. Um, one of the things that um, is certain in this world of uncertainty is my intention uh, behind the work I do, and that is to uh, unify the voice, voices of our queer uh, 2S LGBTQ community um, on important matters. And there's nothing more important in my uh, view right now than facing the pandemic of hate that is coming toward our community. This picture um, on the slide is at a counter protest of a hate rally in Kelowna. And my caption for this picture is standing together. And standing together um, is the only way that we can face this barrage of hate that's directed toward us right now, in my view. And um, I was actually very honored to be able to stand between uh, a trans couple in this picture uh, that was captured by the news. And uh, it's, it speaks to me very loudly of being able to um, create solidarity and unify um, our voices uh, where we can stand together when standing alone is not sufficient and not safe. One of the things that um, started out um, earlier this year was the um, being able to create a message that the community could um, build around and stand together on. And this um, idea of this campaign came as a result of seeing a billboard that was put up in Wisconsin uh, by a um, the artist, was a trans artist called Trans Painter. And so this idea came alive in Kelowna to create a message of our own on our own billboard. And so what we did was we created a focus group to come together of community members across the community to come up with a message and a theme for our billboard campaign. And the message that came out of this was, you belong. 
I'm really deeply grateful for the consultation and the gracious uh, support from the Seok Language House and the Sp uh, Spokane uh, Salish uh, folks, uh, language folks who helped us with the phrase and the good words in the, the, the language that you see that supports this message, which is ku ya ya ku kenkwithung nehiam. And that means we are all together, we all join together. And <clears throat> at the outset of this project and in the work of Advocacy Canada, we want to do our work in, uh, through the lens of decolonization and being able to understand the systemic ways in which the systems that we are part of are destructive and we need to break them down and restore um, things to the way that they actually work. Um, this um, message is on a billboard right now in Kelowna, on two billboards actually, it's been running for 16 weeks. We created a GoFundMe campaign and within a couple of weeks, we raised $8,000 from our community to uh, <clears throat> support this campaign. We uh, put out a call for artists and we were able to engage with an indigenous two-spirit artist to create this beautiful work. And uh, her name is Sarah Jones. She lives in Kelowna, she's Ojibwe. And she created this um, art based on representation of things that are found in nature in the Okanagan as well as regalia that she saw in the history of her family and her clan. And <clears throat> so if you want to look her up, it's uh, Honey Cub Pokes. And uh, she, she's just a beautiful, beautiful spirit and it was so wonderful to work with her. Um, <clears throat> through that focus group, we were able to create um, an ongoing message of belonging. And these billboards are not just a message for um, our sense of belonging in the community, where in many spaces that we go into, we feel that we don't belong. But it's also reframing the conversation of where we live is a welcoming place where we belong. So it's not just for us, it's for reframing that whole conversation. When people look at Kelowna, they look at it as a place where we're welcome, where we welcome everyone, where everyone belongs. And that is the message that we want to uh, resonate. We created a cross-community working group. And representation is incredibly important in the work that we do in bringing people together to deal with hate and how we respond to these um, emerging events and how we evolve um, our responses and our, uh, whether they're reactive or proactive is really important in having many, many voices at the table. And uh, so this cross-community working group in Kelowna has been responsible for um, coming together whenever needed, on demand. We have a Slack group where we communicate and we share important information about events, uh, things that we can see that are happening that we need to respond to in the community. One of the things that we did was we created um, a group to support Trans Day of Visibility. And we ha were able to bring together over 300 people to come out and um, enjoy the um, uh, performances of trans and non-binary artists. And through that, we were able to raise funds and pay honorariums to those people, some people who are dealing with food and housing insecurity. And so these are kind of things that we need to collaborate on, not just to uh, bring the community together, but to take care of each other. And so that's part of uh, what we're doing as a cross-community working group. This picture here is uh, from a rally that we held in October. So when the hate groups held their rally, we, we were outnumbered the first time. Uh, there was 500 of them. They were led by a uh, pastor from a church chanting at us, groomers, go home. And uh, it was extremely traumatic for very, very many people. So we created our own rally of support. And as you can see, the banner uh, of the You Belong campaign was, was proudly displayed and held up by volunteers. And 
I don't know what happened, but I happen to be wearing something <laughs> today that matches my slides. <laughs> um, it, we're now selling merchandise um, of shirts, hoodies, stickers, and postcards that you can send to people with these messages of you belong. Uh, another thing that's really important is creating partnerships. Uh, so we put out a call um, for partners to help us with our, uh, our rally, uh, our You Belong rally, and we had um, the Kelowna, um, uh, this group and organization in Kelowna said, we wanna be the, the safety stewards at your event, and so they came, and this is them wearing anti-bullying shirts that they bought from the Kelowna Friendship Society, which is a indigenous society in Kelowna, so collaborating, supporting them. Um, they were our safety stewards, and they were there to support us. Um, it's important to create spaces for expression um, and things that people can do. We had a chalk art uh, the day before one of the hate rallies, and we went and we, we, we put chalk art everywhere. When they did their rally, they had to stand on top of that. They had to stand on those messages on the risers in front of uh, where they stood with their platform of hate, it said trans lives matter in chalk. This was a community effort. We put sign, people had sign making parties and we came and we stood in solidarity. Um, I circled the Bible in the back pocket of that person. Um, they weren't there to support us. <laughs> That's kind of what we're dealing with. This is, um, what I call it a, a solidarity army. We need to build our communities to come out. There was over 700 people that came out to support us. We could put a call out to many, many different organizations. I got inspired, invited to speak to the union leaders of 44 different unions. They came out to support us. The Boys and Girls Club supplied um, food and, and snacks for the people that came out when we had a march. Um, it's important to carry that message forward and keep it in our hearts. Um, what I encourage people to do is when you find the beauty in yourself, you can look for it in others and you can look for it in the places around you. That is carrying the message forward. Uh, one of the things that we need to do as well is we need to be on top of tracking hate. Uh, we don't need to do it ourselves. There can be, we've got a whole volunteer group of people in Kelowna that watch all these social media channels and are um, actively watching to see what's happening in our community so that we can be proactive and respond to it. Some of the things that um, uh, I think are important to uh, remember and, and on that previous slide as well is uh, don't engage when you're watching those channels because they will boot you out. Uh, so just stay quiet and just lurk <laughs> and, and just uh, uh, creep on their pages and watch what's, do, what's happening. Um, protect your personal information. I've been the target of a lot of online hate and it's also coming into the physical realm where I've been chased down the street and blocked and tried to be harassed. I now carry a panic uh, whistle. Um, the police have warned me about um, my personal safety. Uh, so if you're a leader in the community and you're doing this kind of work, you need to take precautions. Never share photos with your location because even if you send them to a friend and it has a location tag on it and they had inadvertently share it to somebody else, then they know where you are. So protect your information. Um, don't go alone to protest. I made the mistake of walking from the group to go to my car to get something and while I was going to my car, people came after me. I was by myself, I shouldn't have gone by myself. So don't be alone, uh, go in groups. And, um, you know, the police aren't always our friends, but they are important in, in reporting incidents too, even if they don't do anything, in most cases they don't. Um, they tell me that we can't police ourselves out of these situations, but it's important to record the incidents that happen with them so it's on record, there's a file, they know who those people are, um, and they can, um, if something does happen, then there's more chance of, of action being taken. So in closing, um, don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't do things on your own. Build a, a response group that can work with you. I'm so fortunate in Kelowna that there's, there's dozens and dozens of volunteers that work and, and offer assistance and help. 
it, we have to be in this together. And we, uh, there's one thing that this pandemic of hate, um, we have to deal with. We can't isolate ourselves. Isolation is the enemy. Uh, we need to build our community strong. We need to come together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wilbur. Last but certainly not least, we have Noé Prefontaine. Noé is a disabled, white, queer Métis person from the Red River Valley with generations of ancestral roots on this land. They currently work as a research coordinator and instructor within Winnipeg's Investigators Program, learning alongside other queer and trans folks actively involved in questioning and queering research as we know it. Please welcome Noé. Hi, good morning, wow, oh, oh my gosh. I swear that wasn't me. Can you still hear me okay? Oh yeah, okay. I'm gonna put this, try to put this safely. Hi, I'm gonna take a breath. My heart was racing there for like a minute straight. <laughs> okay, I was the best advice I was given by a couple of people is just take a breath. So this is my first official national conference presentation. Yeah. And uh, I'll introduce myself in a little bit more in a bit, but just on the heels, like this is the core of the energy of this conference for me, this gathering of people, the work that we've done in investigators, the work that CBRC and other you know, organizations support has been uh, like people opening doors, right? And it's been two-spirited queer trans folks that have opened the doors for me. So anyways, that's the spirit. So thank you to all for the advice. And there's a ton of people in this room and ton of people outside that I could name, but just thank you, thank you. And now before I get too far off. I'm going to get this ready. So I guess I could e do either one. But uh, the title of the presentation is How We Keep It Spicy and Grow Together. So um, let me just move to the next. Well, before I move to the next slide, um, that's me, the first one. Rusty, I don't think, is in the room today. He wasn't able to join us, but he's the lab manager, so my boss. So I'm unsupervised right now, watch out. Um, and the remaining names on there are listed in alphabetical order, and that is our investigators, which is to say our learners um, in our program. So uh, they will also all have their names as a line on their CV as a national conference presentation, which is the core of capacity strengthening, in my opinion. That is the real social capital that will be passed on from you being part of this work today. So, okay. Yeah, and it, this is the kind of my land acknowledgement. So I'm uninvited here. CBRC invited me, but to my knowledge, no indigenous peoples from this land gave me, uh, invited me. So I just wanted to say thank you. And I've seen so many beautiful things in the last like day or so. So I just wrote a few of them down. Like I don't see mountains. Uh, Rusty and I traveled about just 2,300 kilometers from Winnipeg, what's, what's known as Winnipeg. And I thought, how long did that actually take? 21 days straight walking. Um, 30 days if I took nine days rest in total. And I thought, I can't even conceive of that really. And so the way that it's felt is new things, new sights, new smells, new people, and all sorts of things. So I've seen the mountains, big water close to where I sleep. Like it's right there. There's not a lot of big water, open water close to where I sleep in Winnipeg. Uh, and uh, planes readying for takeoff next to people walking their dogs. That's nuts. And color, there's like autumnal rainbows everywhere, like all the beautiful shades of rust and brown and everything. Coast Salish public art manhole covers in the financial district, like public art funded projects. I need to find out about that. And people and people. And, uh, and I learned actually from a speaker who, uh, Sen Senequila on CBC YouTube video, uh, that the original name for, or kind of one of the roots of Vancouver is Kem um, and uh, which says the land of many maples or a grove of maples. So a couple of days ago, yeah, this is still the land acknowledgement. Um, a couple of days ago, uh, I went yesterday morning, I was at Jervis and Robson, which is uphill and away from the water. Uh, and uh, I saw this beautiful red tree, like neon red, like that sweater, like pops out in the crowd. And I thought, that doesn't make any sense. Like, how is it still so bright? So I went up and investigated 
ask someone nearby, do you think they'd be offended? And I thought, I'm, su I'm such a prairie person. <laughs> no, one, no, no one is wondering about this one leaf on this tree. So anyways, I plucked it and I brought it to my family. We had a dinner last night and I asked them, I said, like this maple and blah, 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 chem, chem, lie, and I'm learning and all these things. And my uncle, who is kind of involved in botany, says, that's a Japanese maple. I'm like, oh my gosh, I gotta look into this now. So anyways, the name of that maple is Ariadne. It's a specific type of leaf which refers to Greek mythology. And if you like Greek mythology and you love queer and trans and plants and all that stuff. Exactly, that, yes. Yeah, that tree, that color. <laughs> yeah, so the spirit of that is what I bring into my land acknowledgement, which is I'm so grateful to be here, but I also wasn't supposed to be here. Like, this is a different place and I'm really honored to be seeing all these things. So, holy crow, without further ado. Um, yeah, this is, this is me. I'm a white uh, Métis person, queer Métis person from Winnipeg. That's where my family is from. Uh, hundreds of years on one side, and then Ukrainian settler, Austrian, former Austro-Hungarian empire on the other side. Uh, and I just wanted to say thank you. These are the colors on the ground at the park across from my place, which is my number one therapeutic setting in terms of, men of the mental health intervention. It's the park across my building. And those are the colors we have, which are beautiful, but you can see how the red really sticks out <laughs> once you fly 2,300 miles or kilometers. Um, as part of our process with investigators, which I will describe, I promise, very shortly, we do uh, like a check-in kind of word poetry. It's speaking of kind of like creative expression and expressing ourselves through our communities. Uh, we started doing the kind of classic Zoom check-in, like what's your word, right? Uh, we meet in person, so we started, I started writing them down, and it became clear that when we did it at the outset of our time together and at the end, like energy emerged, a kind of like a theme, a capture of the mood. And so one of our learners, uh, one of our group uh, started call it, calling it like word poetry. And then another one thought, hey, what about emerging AI art methods and digital autoethnography? What if we inserted these poems into AI art generators and then captured these different textures? And anyway, so as part of our year one report, our knowledge product, which is available on the Village Lab site, all of the artworks that are contained in there were either created by them or generated from this word process. So, or word poetry. So my check-in is I'm incredibly nervous, but so happy, and I've ca caught the eyes of a couple of people that I hadn't seen yet, so I'm very thrilled. Um, the Investigators is uh, uh, CBRC supported and Village Lab supported uh, program. The Village Lab is run by Dr. Rusty Suleimanov at the University of Manitoba in the Faculty of Social Work. He is one of the people who opened doors for me. Actually, one of the first. He gave me my first RA position. I was making $18 an hour, which was the most I'd ever been paid legally to do anything. And, uh, and then I met a lot of other people, Zach Marshall also, and so, um, it, it's just, it's incredible. So that's, this is the core of this work, is a capacity strengthening research program for queer and trans folks, not necessarily involved with academia, you know, um, who wanna learn about health and community research. So essentially, when we got together, we thought we wanna co-create whatever the heck we're gonna do. We have a lot of resources. What are we gonna do together? So it was messy. <laughs> it was very messy, maybe as you can tell by the, by the flow of this presentation already. And so we said we wanna keep it spicy. So we want it to be, we want it to feel like we're at our kitchen table, at the drag show, whatever. What is that care, that community care, and how can we bring it into what we wanna to learn together? Um, so yeah, the big question, and I, I certainly, I'm not trying to prompt anything, thank you, um, is like, what seeds of research are we watering? We tried to think like how we do research and why we do it in the way and what interests us and what stories do we want told? So this was like weeks and weeks of hashing this out. And then as I said, Village Lab, I won't reiterate. So a lot of the work that we did in year one, we're now at the close of our second year, um, is, is in this report, so I recommend you read it. It's very colorful and fun. Um, I may pass over this slide, but just know it is taken from the report, so you will not miss it. Uh, but the key theme was, we talked about protective factors or other ways in which we build community and embrace resilience and celebrate love without always responding to hate, without hate being the things that is signified and being referred to. So we talked about being listened to like what is justice, what is care, what is a mental health intervention, which is the focus of this grant. Um, and it was this idea of like when we're heard and when we're listened to is like an essential protective health factor for queer and trans folks, two-spirited folks. 
Um, so yes, this is so exciting. So we started doing this craft time. We explored photo voice in the year one, and then we kind of wanted to deepen our exploration of arts-based methods, and I love in a good acronym. So community responsive action facilitating transformation. And I'm running through this, but if you want to talk to me about any of these images you see, trust me, I'll talk to you all day. Um, so, so I will go through these quickly, but I honor each of these are incredible works that represented much discussion around our circle. So uh, yeah, marshes are queer and trans, and this idea of like, yeah, find your happy. Um, people, we, we purchase, thank you PHAP, we purchase so much stuff. Um, for this, for and supplies and artworks. On the far right is a, the first harm reduction pigeon that Luca, one of our investigators, beaded for me. It has cannabis, sweet grass, cedar, tobacco. It sits on my altar, so to speak. Um, and then they beaded a bigger one. And so this was part of their residency at a kind of like an incredible art program, community arts program. And uh, like throughout the course of this time together with our circle, their pals, their kin, their kin now, um, unprompted by me or any, any person who could have tried to suggest anything, everyone showed up to the gallery and like supported this work. Luca donated this giant, by the way, scale not clear from this image, harm reduction pigeon, and uh, all the proceeds went to the mobile, mobile overdose prevention site which is a site like that distributes safer sex supplies and harm redu other harm reduction surprise safe using supplies that just got their funding 100% cut by the province of Manitoba. And so it's community that's fundraising and trans and queer affirming community resource centers that are doing this. So like when I think about community care, which by the way, that's a card that Luca gave me that when I opened it inside, it said your voice dropped after it started taking HRT a couple months. So like this is, this is it for me reflects the core of all the brilliance that it's like, oh, the messy thing that we're trying to replicate, it's happening. Not really exactly sure how it's happening aside from being listened to and in kinship. So I had a note for myself for two minutes, so now I gotta see what it was. <laughs> I thought, I have to say this. If I haven't said anything, I have to say this. Um, maybe I'll just go to the next slide, which might inspire. Oh, of course, well, keeping it spicy, how could I not? Okay, so the, uh, this was the, the, on the lower, on the, the lower of the kind of the three images was a screen print that Jess Crawford created. Uh, another great person that I've met through this program. And it was this idea of keeping our work spicy, keeping it cool, keeping it fresh. And uh, the O represented by uh, the Instax camera that we purchased for all of our participants with film uh, to explore photo voice. And then they modified it, digitized it with a tea bag to represent the eyes and the practice of sharing tea. Sharing tea with each other, sharing tea with ideas, sharing tea with the concept of research. And then they did a little new pepper, so I beaded it. <laughs> and Rusty, if he's here, is wearing one. So, um, so if I could try to sum this up in less than 40 seconds here, is um, through all this, like it's very cool that people came together and like built community and did the art, but that might not be enough to like prove to a funder or to whoever that we did a thing. Um, and uh, this is, uh, so in, in Manitoba, there's like the Winnipeg School Division, there's also the Louis Rail School Division, it's one of the biggest school divisions. Um, all of the activism surrounding the Protect Our Children pieces in Manitoba um, and in the Louis Rail School Division were started by our investigators. And by that I mean like not in our sessions, <laughs> like texting each other. I didn't give them each other's numbers, like this is what we do and they, they did it and are learning and feeling like we can, people are voting in us, right? Like people voted in me, like people probably voted, you know, in a lot of you. And so all these images are for, for the, from that. This is also an image from one of the like celebrate love, celebrate re resilience and joy. Um, and then I truly can't skip this. So when we had Elder Albert McLeod come and join us again in our circle a couple of weeks ago. And what I'll say from this slide that is like essential is he suggested wit. He was like, wit is a teacher. Like, bring wit with you. A, don't give up the space. Don't surrender, you know, the risers with the chalk on it. Like, don't give up the space, but wit as well. Like, like and uh, so maybe you could ask him about that. I won't try to misspeak on his behalf. Uh, I won't talk about that because I have to tell you about this. So, um, I encountered this word when I really, really needed it. When I first met Rusty, before I met a ton, like, 
ton of people who changed my life and you know helped me get here today. Um, I came across this. It was Edmund Meditawoban is a Cree knowledge keeper and elder, and he volunteered these words and offered them as part of the consultation for the TRC. It's printed, well, in English, um, in the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation on the campus, which is on the University of Manitoba Fort Gary campus on Treaty One. So I came across this, and I was like, "This is incredible. This is incredible. This is exactly. This is the feeling that I have of what really, like, what seeds I want to nurture. How I do. How I, how people have helped me out in the academic industrial complex. And this is the seed. This is the seed." Uh, but I never knew how to pronounce it, and I've been working on my own Michif language study um, to, for a lot of reasons. Um, but I never could find how to pronounce this online. Uh, a month ago, I'm in the park across the place that I live, and uh, I'm sitting on a bench, and I end up having a conversation with uh, a man who offers me a king can at the beginning of our talk, and I said, no, thank you. It was 3 p.m., and I do not judge, but I was not interested at the time, and uh, we end up having a conversation about all sorts of things, about uh, Palestine, about his childhood, about uh, how life was like at Sap on, which is at the tip of the kind of Lake Winnipeg, uh, Sapatoya Cree First Nation, and so I learned about him. As I'm leaving, I have the thought, I say, oh, something, could I share this with you? And I said, I don't mean to be like that person, but you, you, what you just said reminded me of this, which I have memorized, of course, because I love it. And uh, I said it, and I said, I'm sorry, I'm going to say it with a French accent. So I said, quinto patate. And he says, oh. And he goes, I'm a Cree language instructor. And I'm like, excuse me? And he says, it's kiki na totatate. So it's kiki na totatate. And of course, with different like dialects in different regions, it could be a little bit different, but I thought, I cannot believe this. So just in time to share it with you, thank you for letting me go over. I don't think there's much else. Oh yeah, of course, this is our group, so I won't list them all, but you've got Albert and me awkwardly standing to the next, and yeah. Thanks for letting me share with you all. Thank you to our amazing and informative speakers. We have about 15 minutes for Q&A. So I'm actually gonna ask our speakers to come back up here so that I can use the portable mic to take to folks in the room. We also do, for folks who are able to get up and want to ask their questions, we do have a mic over here if you wanna form a line. Uh, otherwise, just raise your hand and I'll come over to you. Go ahead. Um, I have a question for Landon. I know you discussed the um, stats of like hate reporting, um, um, how the police keeps track, et cetera, et cetera, but I also know that you're uh, doing a workshop about community interventions. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, has there been, like in your research, have you noticed a difference in like community-based interventions and, and what were they like? Um, if I can just ask a quick clarifying question, um, how, how do you understand community interventions? Well, I'm, I'm just imagining, um, like, you know, I'm thinking of transformative justice when I'm asking that question. Like, is the reporting of the crime really doing much? Like, is that what we're, you know, kind of going towards? Or, like, if we're doing a community-based approach, then, like, um, you know, like, it's not very you know, there's no rules, it's just transformative. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, you know, what I'm thinking of when I'm thinking community. Thank you, yeah, the, thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, so totally, uh, I, I agree with you that the, the reporting itself, especially as we can see from the research, doesn't necessarily mean that people are gonna get the kind of services that they're looking for. And uh, as uh, in the research, people reported to about 14 different kind of uh, parties and uh, across the board there was uh, an inconsistency in the, the services that, that people received when they made those reports. And so I, I think what that speaks to is the need to build our capacity as, as community members and community organizations to make sure that we can support one another uh, even if uh, some of the, the institutions that are usually given the responsibility to do that aren't able to do it well while at the same time working to make sure that those institutions respond as as, with as much a high quality service as possible. Uh, does that address your yeah, question? Yeah, sorry, just a quick follow up. So yeah. what do you suggest to us right now when we're like 
say a friend comes to me and they're like, I've been, you know, victim of a hate crime. What do I do? Thank you. That's a really great question. And I, I, I will say that the, the workshop that we're doing this yeah. afternoon is going to get into that a lot more. But I think the first few things that I'll say, because I also want to be mindful of other people's questions, is listening and believing people is so imperative. That is the thing that I hear over and over from the people that I talk to, is to be listened to and heard. People are so often dismissed. Uh, and so from there, with that listening and that validating, then working to understand what people are looking for. Uh, some people may wish to make a report. Some people just want to, to feel validated and seen. And so starting with that and working to understand what that person is looking for, I think would be the first two steps. Sweet, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. We have another question. Hello, my name is Logan Giovanni. Uh, I am a proud board member of Rezo, who uh, has one of the keynote speak speeches. Uh, my question is for Wilbur. Um, aside from being on the board of Rezo, I'm an intervention worker, a proximity worker for Aztec, which is the Action Santé Trans et Travestia du Québec, which is the lar largest trans and uh, bi-spiritual organization in Quebec. Currently, we are going through funding crisis, and we uh, might close down in April, unfortunately. Um, I really enjoyed your, your talk about how we can build stronger communities together, but I don't know if you had any, um, any suggestions for mobilization of our allies, because at the end of the line, um, the funding we can't take from our community because we're already marginalized, we're already precaire, on n'a pas d'argent, tout ça. So I was wondering if, excuse me for my franglais, I come from Quebec, uh, Montreal. Uh, but I don't know if you had uh, any suggestions to be able to mobilize our allies, mobilize uh, other people around the community to be able to make sure that the people who should be giving the money, who have the most money, can actually give the money and make sure that we can continue, continue our work to strengthen our communities and to be able to keep fighting another day. Thank you. That's a great question. <clears throat> One of the things that we've done in Kelowna is um, when we have these events that we support for the trans community, and there's, there's a number of them, um, uh, our organization sets at the door and we take donations. And <clears throat> all, all the admission to the events is based on a donation and a suggested minimum. And we find that um, by putting out a message to the community that this is for, for supporting this community, that people come and they just give and they give. It's not uncommon <clears throat> for someone to come to an event that's a suggested donation of $10 and give 100. It's not uncommon for um, a young person to dig in the pockets and pull out change and give it to you. Um, people want to have an outlet. People want to give. We just need to create a space for them to do that. Another one of the things that the trans community is doing in Kelowna that we are supporting 100% is they have a do-it-yourself punk rock scene. And uh, they put on events and we, um, it, it's a way for them to rage. It's a way for them to express themselves and we support those. And we come out and we set up a table and we invite people to come and listen and, and participate in a safe space. And those donations come in and we set up a community fund for the trans community. So I think there's, there's different ways that you can do it, but I think the message needs to be really, really strong to the community that we need. Uh, we, we don't necessarily want corporate money. Uh, we don't want to um, sanitize the message to fit to a corporate message or a corporate mold. We want people in the community to come out and support us in a do-it-yourself fashion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wilbur. We have time for maybe one more question. I just didn't want to get up. Thank you. Um, I have a comment and a question. My comment is for Noe. That was a really incredible presentation, and you did an amazing job. And I, I have a question for David. I was wondering about with childhood bullying, I, I feel like f with my experience, like as a young person, especially a little kid, like I didn't necessarily understand, nor did the kids around me, like, you know, race or sexuality or gender and like what that was for me. But when I look back, I feel like we did know, like we knew who to bully. Um, 
so I know that's not a, I know for a lot of people like they very much knew exactly who they were from a very young age and that's fabulous. But for others, it took like a longer time. So I wonder if there's something in there about experiencing that kind of childhood bullying without it, like on those grounds, without it necessarily being explicitly named and like how you kind of understood that in the study. Yeah, no, I think that, thank you, actually. That's a fantastic uh, question. Um, I don't think there's like a, a very fabulous or perfect answer to that because you raise kind of a complexity with any time we try to measure something. Like, did you experience this? Oh, no, did I? Um, and so, you know, I, I think that's that's part of the challenge. Um, the the notion of the, the the first scale really is like looking at when you are younger, and then the discrimination scale is kind of like is more have you ever experienced this? So even that's why they were analyzed separately because they're kind of different time frames. Um, but I think you're right. I don't think these capture everything. I, I want to be super clear. This is not capital T truth at all. Um, it's some information that I think could be useful. There's very little information out there about queer positive folks and their experience, these experiences. In fact, I, I think there's only one or two other kind of analyses that have ever been done to look at that. So it's, I think of it as opening a conversation about more that we can do, and I think there's more we need in terms of people's qualitative understanding of that as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I'm happy to talk to you more about that, but I think you're right on. Thank you.